to George Lopez. All right. Thank you, everybody. Have thank you. Seat. Thank you. Thank you. Have a seat. Yes. Congratulations. Somebody asked me, yeah, how's this weather? I'm like, shit, this is the kind of, this is the same temperature of the room I grew up in. He's still got his outside jacket on. I love on. That's it. How I'm cold it is. It's nice. I feel good. I love this temperature. Well, welcome. Congratulations. This movie is incredible. I got to watch it a few days ago, and I was so moved by the story of, uh, of these four young men, even though it's a story that's been told in, in Wired Magazine. There was a documentary. Yeah. This story, that, as you tell it, goes far deeper. What, what made you, what compelled you to make this movie? Well, you know, this, this country and this world is, is made up of underdogs. Uh, this is really the first movie that I've done where social media plays such a huge part in, in, in getting the awareness out, right? So, you know, movie companies hire uh, publicity firms and they hire, um, you know, people to do focus groups. But I'm going to tell you this, man. Uh, Carlos Pena Vega is in the, is in the movie as well. He, he, he's in a Big Time Rush. And between he and I, we have created a social media buzz that is second only to American Sniper. So this is a really small movie, but I think that everybody has a dream. I think everybody can relate to this movie, and everybody is always wanting to be a hero. And we're all put out, like I was an underdog. when I, Everybody's an underdog. This movie is about underdogs becoming heroes. And, and, and possibly this weekend, at, we're not in the same amount of theaters, clearly, but I think this movie, because people you know, are underdogs, could, could, can, uh, can get noticed this weekend. So this is the, this is the story of four young men who um, strive to build a robot. Well, you know, they're little misfits in school. You know, they don't fit in. Um, uh, they get bullied and, and things. This happened in 2004. So a teacher goes, a teacher's at the school, he decides to create a robotics club, and then these kids come in, and, and they're not formally trained. They're just very intelligent kids, and they go and get um, motors from old cars, of little race cars and stock cars and those little motors. And then uh, we in the movie went to a hardware store to get PVC pipe and glue and trolling motors, things that aren't uh, necessarily the same kind of uh, um, things a college would use or any other high school that has that has funds, you know. So, um, in in all in truth, I found out from the kids that they got the PVC pipe not from a hardware store, but from the side of one of the kids' house that they had PVC pipe. And then they created this robot that was an underwater robot. They designed it. They did the program for it. And they went to Santa Barbara to compete. And instead of competing against high schools, because they thought it would be embarrassing to lose to high schools, they entered in, coll in, 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 in the college division. And uh, they beat uh, Stanford, Cornell, Duke, Harvard, uh, Florida, and MIT, and these are four kids. The team consists of only four young Latino kids, and they beat MIT not only in 2004, 2005, and 2006, and they continue to excel at robotics at a community high school. So it's a very powerful little movie. But there's the added twist that these four young men are undocumented. The four, the four guys are are undocumented, yes. So uh, they, when they win, you think when you win a competition like that, that all good things happen. But unfortunately, because of their status, uh, it didn't turn out that way. And the movie deals with that. It's not a movie about immigration. It's just a, it happens to be a situation that was real to the story. But um, uh, you don't have to be Latino to, to, to enjoy this film. When I was watching Rocky or Karate Kid or um, the movies that I liked... Uh, I didn't look at uh, the Karate Kid as an Italian kid from New York trying to fit in in California. I just looked like a kid that was having a hard time fitting in. So, Well, I remember um, as I was watching the movie, and again, it's called Spare Parts, opens Friday. Uh, <laughs> Got to get those names in. Spare Parts. In. Spare Parts. Uh, as I was watching it, I was thinking a lot about my boyhood during the 70s in the Bronx. Yeah. Um, Blue collar family. My father is functional illiterate. And... I was told I was going to be a mechanic. Right. And nothing wrong with being a mechanic, no. but I had bigger dreams for myself. Right. And I was watching this movie and, and connected so deeply with these four young men because they 
achieve by their wits and by any means necessary, right. which is the ultimate American dream. Well, there's an ingenuity that you have when you don't have the money that everyone else has that you create uh, a way to get things done. Uh, and um, uh, I think it was in the, in the clip, the, the, the thing. So, so this robot leaked. It, the, the, the soldering iron had touched the, the rubber the, of seal and it made a, a small burn. And when the robot was in the water... Uh, it would uh, mis misfunction because it, water got into the wire, just a little bit of wire, water. So they had to create a, a way to that it could f still function. Uh, and they used a sock, they used a towel, and that didn't work. And then they said, we need something that's really absorbent and small. And they used a uh, feminine product it's to put in there. It's one of the funniest <laughs> scenes in this movie. <laughs> And it's it, absolutely hilarious, and it, it did, and it did work. And the judges thought that was uh, that was genius to be able to do that. Instead of instead of cr redoing the whole thing, they found a way to make it work in the water for that time that it was actually doing its uh, running its course. So this movie rep uh, represents, um, from 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 an observer's point of view, uh, a shift in your. In your goals creatively, that you want to tell, you want to do a different kind of storytelling. Is that um, fair? You know, I've been very fortunate to be able to have done a lot of things. You know, my sitcom was very successful on ABC, and then, you know, my talk show ran a couple of years, and that was fun. Uh, but uh, being a producer of this movie, Spare Parts, and uh, uh, having it be a tiny movie with, uh, you know, Marissa Tomei came on the movie, and it changed everything because, you know, Academy Award winner. And then that drew a lot of attention to the movie. Uh, and then when Jamie Lee Curtis came on the movie, and Jamie Lee Curtis doesn't really leave Los Angeles much to do movies because of family obligations. And we did this in New Mexico, and Jamie Lee Curtis came for two days. She's great in the movie, holds it down uh, very well. And then I called Isai Morales, and Isai Morales plays one of the kids' fathers. And then I, I, I play the teacher. It's very dramatic for me, very some, diff, something very different than people are used to seeing me uh, do. It's a great performance. Heavy. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Very heavy, dramatic stuff, but fun still stuff too. So it's humorous. And it doesn't, the jokes don't lay there like jokes. They just lay there like conversations that people would have that would be, that would be humorous. It doesn't necessarily, it's not broad, but uh, it's, it's subtle. And the subtle stuff is sometimes um, very funny as well. Well, it's very human and very relatable. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, we're talking about the movie Spare Parts. Let's take a, should we take a look at a clip from the movie? Yeah, let's see what this. Uh... That's a scene <laughs> from Spare Parts starring George Lopez. So... How many times did she slap you? I can only remember the first four. <laughs> I think there might have been three more over there. You know, it shook my molars, man. It, like, it really does roll your eyes in your head. Because I'm guessing the Oscar-winning Marisa Tomei doesn't fake a slap. I said, I don't think she needs to hit me. And then it was never a situation where she wasn't going to hit me. Like, I don't think she needs to hit me. Like, maybe once. She's hardcore. Shh, that's... <laughs> That's a real, my grandmother hit me, but never like that. So, my grandmother hit me from behind. I never saw her coming. This one I saw it was still a surprise. Tell me about the the place you reached for to find the confidence to lead this movie with such a big cast, with these young actors who were really looking to you for guidance. Uh, that That's a big order for anybody. Well, you know, if you think about the... If you think about everybody's dreams and what you aspire to be when you're young, it just everything just looks like it's impossible. But really, nothing is impossible. So in looking at these young kids, now not, forget color, everybody thinks it's wrapped up in color, but if you look at these young kids who for under $800 created this and designed this robot to function, and then, because you don't think enough of your ability to... To, to enter with high schools because you think you're going to come in last, you enter in against colleges because you think if you can beat one college, then that's a victory. So even in our own dreams, we still create doubt in ourselves. And that's what's really powerful about this movie. For me, you know, I, I, you know when I was growing up, man, I, I, I wrote jokes on the back of envelopes that were already used. And I... And whatever I could find, and uh, you know, it, it, now that I look back, it was difficult to keep going back to a place and to comedy clubs and things when you you're not very good and you're trying to find your way. But there's something that makes you go back and not quit. And you know, quitting um, 
is uh, is is the end, you know. And uh, you know now when we raise kids and there's so much that they're given, you can't you can give somebody a a a, a, a car and you can give somebody a compliment, but you can't give somebody will to continue. That has to come from within. Where did you find your will? Go all the way back to when you you knew that this is what you wanted. Uh, there's no more terrifying thing than standing on a stage with a no. microphone in your hand. No. None. So I just felt like I was different. You know, I felt like I was a little bit different. I'm, I, I, listen, I, I, I am not, uh, I wasn't the best student in high school. And I, and I did realize when I got out of school and I started to try to get into the workplace that I did, I did squander several years of education trying to be cool and trying to be funny with time that I could not get back. And uh, that, that was very disappointing to me. One of the things I think that hurt me the most was that I finally realized that uh, you know all the guys that I hung out with are gone, and then you know things change, and then you're left with what you've learned in school. And I, I really didn't apply myself very much, so I, I always had been drawn to comedy, and and I thought you know this is going to be something that's going to be harder than anything that I ever tried to do in my life. And I I used to quit. I quit when things got tough. And I had a high school baseball coach that he and I, when I was in high school, got into it, and, and he, he, he broke me down. He said, man, when things get tough, you quit, and you're never gonna be anything in life because you're a quitter. There's nothing worse than a quitter. And then um, when I started to play golf in, in 1981, and it was hard, I would quit. Like, I'd play seven holes, and I'd tell the guys I'm leaving. And they'd say, where are you going? I said, nah, it's, you know, not playing very good, I wanna go home. And one day on one of those trips home, that, the, like I just thought of this guy, this teacher, Steve Martin. And I said, man, this guy was right. You know, he was right. And then when baseball season started, usually around in March, one day I was probably 22. I, I drove to the high school and got out of my car. And after baseball practice was over, and I walked up to him and I apologized to him for disrespecting him while I was in high school and told him how much I appreciated him trying to, trying to help me. And it wasn't until almost four years later did I realize that, that everything he was telling me was right. What was it like the first time you felt like you had followed it through to the end and you scored? Well, I, I, it, 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 was a, uh, it was a feeling that, uh, I mean, I've, I've done stand-up a long time and I've done better than that first time many times, but there's nothing like that, like that first time that is kind of a, a transfusion or an influx or an infusion of of uh, of of love and of confidence and of like hey I, c I can I can do this you know I can do this I always expected people to tell me that I could do something but they weren't always going to be around so I needed to believe it myself and then at, at that point in my early twenties I, I believed that I could I could do so I could do this and for those of you if you ever want uh, a boost get to YouTube and type in George Lopez Gay Locos. And look at those old TV shows. Oh. Hilarious. Just the hilarious. hair is hilarious. Yeah, well, but the confidence. Yeah. You, you had great camera presence. Oh, how, how, like that show goes all the way back. Yeah. Uh, uh, but, but, you know, a, a dream doesn't live by itself. You know, I, I've had some, some really... Um, you, know, you, just, you know, everybody's seen the original uh, Willy Wonka, right? So I loved Willy Wonka when I was a kid because it's about a dream. It's about a kid that didn't have a lot of money and there's this chocolate factory. There's six tickets. He never thinks he's going to get one. He finds money in the street. He buys a chocolate and it's in there. And uh, well, I was in Las Vegas in 1990, the summer of 90, opening for Sheena Easton at Bally's. And I saw in USA Today that Johnny Carson was leaving The Tonight Show in 1991. And I remember reading this thing in the Life section, and it said that six new comedians were going to be on The Tonight Show before he left, from that point till the next May of 91, uh, 92. And uh, I never thought of myself being on The Tonight Show, much less thinking I would be one of the last six to do The Tonight Show. So on a Wednesday night in uh, like uh, August of 91, he was leaving in 92, month, two months after. I'm at the Improv in Los Angeles on a Wednesday. And uh, I always try to do my best no matter who was there. If there was 10 people or 100 people. 
And I went up there, and I, I didn't, I did, I didn't do too bad, you know. And this guy comes up to me afterwards, and he says, "I'm Jim McCauley. I'm the talent coordinator for the Tonight Show." And I said, "Oh, hey." He goes, "I like what you, uh, I like what you did." Uh, and I said, "Oh, oh, 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 okay, all right." And then he said, uh, "Congratulations." I, I, I'm gonna, I'm gonna put his hand out. I'm gonna put you on the Tonight Show. And I was like, "What?" He goes, "You, you got, you got the Tonight Show." And I got one of those last six spots before, before Johnny Carson left. Isn't that uh, something? After seeing that thing, yeah. So in your mind, do you allow yourself to believe that that's skill or luck? <laughs> There's a little bit of luck. But listen, if you, know, you half-ass it, that guy doesn't do that. So I never half-assed it because you never know who's going to be out there. Right. So you treat every time like it's your first time. I learned that from Carlos Santana. He said, first time, every time. Uh, first time, every time you do it, treat it like it's the first time. That's, that's good advice. So do you, uh, in, in the moments when you pause and, and, and think about your life, and certainly two days before a big movie opens, you might be doing that. Yeah. Um, do you stop and think that this is part of a mission? Because we did almost lose you a number of years ago. You, you, you <laughs> nearly died. and. As someone who's had a near-death experience myself, yeah. you, you spend some time, I imagine, asking why you got spared. Well, you know, I, I had kidney disease growing up, and I almost, you know, like, you know, when the doctor told me in like '98 that I had kidney disease, you know, I couldn't stand up, and I was on the road, and I kind of bent. I was, I was like, I walked like this, you know, I walked this way. Wow. Uh, during the day and stuff. And, and uh, I flew home like that. And then I went to the doctor, and he took my blood, and he says, wait here, I don't want you to go anywhere until I get the results back. And they took a couple hours. I'm sitting in the room a couple hours, kind of like that, you know, like that. And he says, uh, he comes in, he goes, hey, I got, uh, I got bad news. And I said, uh, what is it? He goes, you have advanced uh, kidney disease. And I said, of course I do. And I said, because what haven't I had in my life? Like, what, what? Yeah, of course I got it. And I said, well, what, what do I need to do? And he's like, well, by the time you're 44, you're going to need a, 45, you're going to need a transplant. And um, I needed one when I was uh, 44. So uh, I've, and then I, I, uh, I uh, told my doctor at Cedars in, La in Los Angeles, I said, listen, man, I, I just want to get this done and I want to go on with my life. I don't want to be a poster boy for kidney disease. I don't want to have people know about it. I just want to just get well and go back to work. And uh, when I had the transplant in April, I think it was the 21st of April of 90, 2005, I woke up and I felt better than I had, I had ever felt in my life. And at that point, I decided that I was going to try to help people with, with, uh, who were sick and to raise awareness for kidney disease and to raise awareness for... Uh, just good health and getting your creatinine level checked, getting your blood pressure checked and things like that. And since then, I've sent a lot of kids to camp who are afflicted with kidney disease. Yeah. I've raised awareness, millions of dollars. <laughs> that's a dude that's like, that's why I go back to work. I don't want nobody to know. But it was inhuman to turn my back on people who were sick. So I, I, could, I couldn't do it. And when I grew up, I was selfish, man. I only thought about myself. And, and I am not anything like I was when I was growing up. I'm not perfect. But uh, I'm, I'm very kind to people. I, I probably am kinder to people than I am to myself, but I'm still working on that part. Well, good for you. Thank you. You know, it's interesting. Um, spare Parts, the new movie starring our new friend. I'm George Spare Lopez. Parts. I got spare parts in me. It is yeah. relatable, I believe, to every person who's in this room. I found it deeply relatable. But at the same time, as I was talking with a, co a colleague of mine, who's Mexican-American, he was so filled with personal pride yeah. because Thank you. he said, I don't ever see myself on, on a screen. Yeah. As, not only as a, as a Latino male, mm -hmm. but as a Mexican-American male. Yeah. So to see this movie and to see you succeed, to see you thrive, is a huge thing. Yeah. So what does it mean to know that he's just one of millions <laughs> I mean, that's a, it, 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 it may seem like a leading question, but no. this movie is more than about all of us. This movie is about Mexican-Americans 
and 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 the fight that they have to endure. Well, there's a there's a there's a fight that uh, everybody has to endure. But uh, you know, I, I will say this: not to not to separate uh, Latinos or Mexican Americans from anybody else. But uh, in in this world right now, uh, there is there is high tension uh, racially, and there's uh, a lot of things that are happening that are causing a lot of people pain. And uh, we as Latinos only want to be included in the conversation. And I agree that all lives matter. And I agree that all children matter. And I agree that all dreams matter. But I also agree that dreams have no color and a dream you cannot do by yourself. And you need other people to help you fulfill your dreams. And we need kindness in a society. And, and uh, we're going to be all right. You know, we, we, uh, we, we are a, a, a strong uh, world. And ignorance has always existed, and it, ignorance knows no color. It's just, it's just, it's just being stupid. Yeah. But uh, uh, um, we as Latinos clearly um, offer uh, quite a bit to this country, so uh, we're, we're happy to be. In, we just want to be included in the conversation. So how um, you, were, you you've been for someone who has such a, a great life as a as a very funny person, you also had this other life where you you have. Uh, Advocated for for people in politics whom you believe for right. believed in, um, and 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 that's not anything like that's in my personality. Like I never really wanted to do that, but um, there's a uh, sense of being able to help that uh, we don't usually have. Like there's that pride there, you know, yeah. there's that pride, or or in being kind to to somebody that I didn't learn um, from anybody in my family. Actually, actually, very unkind. So the unkindness created a kindness in me because I just thought I didn't want to be mean to anybody. So are you taking a look at what your role might be in the next year or two? Uh, I, I, I'm interested how people would, will react to this when they see me uh, dramatic, they see me not like they've, they've seen me on my television show or in animation movies or however they see it's me. It's a very different experience. It's, it's different. And, and I love social media, so you know I, always, I have great friends on social media and you post stuff like that but uh, in no way is social media even it's a, an accelerated life or a, a shinier life than we than we usually live yeah. you know people, they show people working out and they show people taking pictures of their food they show people at the beach and they show people on rooftops and sunsets and sun ups you know the, what about somebody struggling to get out of bed just to stand upright <laughs> nobody posts that well, it's not it's not as sexy hey, as people it think it is. Took me five minutes to straighten up this morning, but but uh, but but in all of that, you know, everybody sen- tends to want to be noticed and uh, cool and popular. But uh, uh, I'd rather just be kind. Do you like being a leader? Well, I don't know if I would call myself a leader, but I I, I like who I am. I like who I'm I'm becoming as I get older. As like the sands of the glass get get uh, less sand. I'm like, I better start being nice. <laughs> I don't have that much sand left. <laughs> why, are people, why are people so not nice? You've, you've, you've made reference to being kind numerous times. and, and it's, There's a me, rush to our society. Just, there's just a rush of, you know, a, a text message is, uh, I, listen, I, I'm, far be it for me to criticize anybody who texts. I, sometimes I only have conversations with people texting, but uh, uh, it's a very impersonal thing yeah. than to pick up the phone and say, hey, man, I'm, I'm running a little bit later. I'll see you when I get there. To, just to, to text. Yeah. Know, it's, it's a very impersonal. So tell me something. What do you find funny about life right now? Um, the foods that people can eat and not eat you know, gluten and whole foods and organic peanut butter and uh, peanut butter allergies and kale. I mean, how long have we been around? I just heard of kale like in the last year. It was just lettuce. There was romaine, there was iceberg, there was like spinach leaves, and all of a sudden kale comes out. And then now there's a uh, low fat vinaigrette. There's uh, there's but when we, when we were growing up, they had shit like uh, Roquefort, which was all cheese and like chunks. It just took forever to for it to get out of the bottle. That salad dressing is gone. Like they said, hey, those were good days. Yeah, those were good days though. So <laughs> a Thousand Island, uh, you know, and and dipping fries and ranch dressing. You know, those are, those were the good old days. Those were the good old days. Peanut man. allergies. I was on a plane and they didn't have peanuts because uh, one passenger had uh, a peanut allergy. 
So I said, time to go Greyhound and give us the rest of the peanuts. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, you have this production company. Mm -hmm. uh, Spare Parts is the first movie from this company, correct? Yep. Uh, so what else do you? How many other movies do you have lined up? I'm looking for the. I'm looking for the next. Uh, you haven't picked the, one. The next project. I haven't picked one yet, but uh, there's some stuff I'm looking at. But uh, you know, I'm. I'm. Uh, you know, to stay in the moment, I'm. I'm waiting to see how. How the. What the reaction to. To me as a dramatic actor is. So. What do you? What? What's? We'll see what happens. I mean, you know, I'm. I'm just so happy. Like. Like I'm doing. I'm still touring, doing stand up. I love doing stand up and. Uh, Myself and Cedric the Entertainer and D.L. Hughley and Eddie Griffin and Charlie Murphy and Mike Epps, all of us are out on tour together. Together? Together. All of us in one show on one night. How often do you see each other? Um, we don't you, can't see, be all, you can't be traveling together. No. We'll see each other at the end of the month in, in Jacksonville and in Tampa then in uh, uh, um, Cincinnati and North Carolina, but we're going to come to New York. We're going to go to D.C. We're going to go to Detroit. We're gonna we're gonna do we're gonna do a big a big tour of this thing, and it is fun. It, it's just a you know, listen, man, we, we got to laugh. It's just a fun night filled with some great comedians. Do you get nervous before you go on stage? Never. Never. No. How do you size up the room when you walk in? Like right now, this yeah. would be a good room right here. Very this diverse. Like a good room. Yeah. Look like there's some sports fans. Very yeah. diverse. This is a, this is a good room right here. You got some people there a little bit older, a little bit younger. This is a this is this is a good room right here. It's a good room. It's I think we should all get together and buy the Knicks. Everybody, pass around a hat. <laughs> Let's turn it all around. <laughs> well, y'all are going to get a chance to answer some uh, ask some questions as yeah. well, but. We do have another clip from Spare Parts. Oh. Shall we take a look? Yeah, let's, you guys want to see it? Come on. Come on. Give them some love. I hope I'm not putting anybody to sleep. Parts opening Friday. George Lopez. Thank you, everybody. What's it like to see yourself on screen? It's pretty, it's pretty brutal. You know, I try, to, I try to make myself look different. That's actually my, my, the real color of my hair, very gray. And uh, no you know offense. I was going to ask no you offense. that next. Yeah, so I decided to go gray. And then uh, let my mustache and uh, and goatee grow, and uh, it was rough because you know people used to seeing you from your TV show, and if you go eat, there's always little kids, and they go, "Hey, this is George Lopez," and they go, "You got old." Like, yeah, right. How old are you? Seven. All right, but that's uh, that was the reaction to that. It's like you got old. I went to a uh, 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 Dwayne Reed, and the and the cash register, the woman at the cash register told me before she even told me hello, said, "You got old." Even before she rang me up, that's she said mean. I got old. It's it's. I guess I'm supposed to look like I looked in that show forever, but I I can't. You look pretty close to it. Thank you. I feel pretty good. Don't uh, let this jacket fool you. There's a little skinny dude under there. <laughs> <laughs> so, are we ready to get some questions from the audience for George Lopez? Yeah. Let's stand up. Let's say where you're from, and let's say favorite song of all time. <laughs> Let's wait, wait, wait. Stuff. What's your favorite song of all time? Uh, mine is, there's a bunch of them. Uh, mine is uh, favorite of all time. Oh. It just makes you go, ah, oh, uh, when you hear it. Wow, that's a pretty good one. Uh, I'm going to say, oh. <laughs> uh, this, this, uh, I'm going to say, I, I'm going to say Reasons from Earth, Wind, and Fire. Wow. It just kept pop. There's so many that kept popping into my heart. I said, I said, reasons was was is so That's great. Pretty good. That's so pretty great. Good. And favorite song, by the way. Don't forget favorite song. I don't have a favorite song of all time. What? <laughs> all right, all right. Since it's George Lopez, I'll tell you my favorite a song of all time is from Snoop Dogg, Gin and Juice. That's what I'm saying. Come on, that's a good, good. song. Good. Gin and Juice. What about the guy next to you? I think his is gin and juice too. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yeah, sir. Question. Yes. Um, on school dance. Um, I like to. You know, you played uh, the father in that movie School Dance. Yes. I was seen it a few months ago. With um, Nick Cannon. Yeah, with Nick Cannon, Mike Epps, so Epps, forth. Yeah. Kevin Hart. Yeah. <laughs> so my question is, um, how was it working in that um movie? Of, um, well, you know, with School yeah. Dance, like movies like that. Um, I just did it with Mike Epps. Is the great thing is that Nick Cannon was uh, was was directing this film about uh, 
um, uh, interracial relationship and a school dance. And uh, he asked uh, a bunch of comedians to be in it. Uh, you know, uh, Kevin Hart was in it, Mike Epps was in it, uh, there's a whole lot of guys in it. And we did it for practically no money, but what we did it for was to help each other out. And that's, that's really a great thing to do, is be able to go in there and say, I got these guys to do it, and looking for no financial reward other than just being able to help another guy. So Mike Epps, I played the president in a Mike Epps movie that he's doing, which is like a parody of The Purge. Uh, that's supposed to be, that looks very funny. So. Um, yeah, so to be able to help somebody just for a day and go in there and knock that out. But School Things came out pretty good. For a movie that wasn't made for a lot of money, that thing, it looks pretty good. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. I was upset that my daughter was dating an African-American gentleman. In the movie. And favorite song, by the way. Favorite song. Forget. Favorite song. I can't think of, I can think of, um, right now I've been getting into Tamia. I don't know if you know her, R&B Tamia. Yes. Um, I've been getting kind of back into her albums okay. a little bit. All right. um, but I will ask you this. Um, how do you decide what projects you get involved with? And is there a particular void in film and television that you'd like to fill? Um, yeah. You know, um, you know, like this, because it was based on a, on a true story and, the Wired article was so was so strong, and I felt that there was a place for a movie like this, you know. Um, but uh, a lot of things are um, uh, uh, a little bit derogatory uh, of just like gangsta. I don't really kind of do that. I don't really do that. But uh, as in a void in TV, um, you know, I'm happy that my first show is still on. I think it's on Nickelodeon every night and MTV, and people get to see that. But if something is good. Uh, and I always try to create it. Like earlier last year, I did a show called St. George on FX, which I liked, by the way, with Danny Trejo, Machete was in it. That was a great David show. David Zayas here from New York. It was a fun show. It was a fun show. I liked it. And uh, it was about a guy who had kind of come up and made a, uh, a, a name for himself and created an energy drink. And I, it's, always, it's always trying to be a little bit positive. But, uh, um, you know, uh, 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 Gina Rodriguez winning a Golden Globe for Jane the Virgin is fantastic. And... Uh, there's great portrayals, uh, you know, scandal and, and, and everything that's going on there. So gradually things, uh, you know, House of Lies, Don Cheadle, and, and, and those shows that are great uh, with leads that are, that are of color are, are all great stuff. So things are, the needle is going in the right direction. Uh, hi, my name is Julian. I just see my favorite song, right? Yes. Uh, probably Break On Through by The Doors. Oh, say. yeah. all right. You guys remember uh, that one? <laughs> yeah. First of all, I want to see your huge inspiration to the whole Latino community. Thank Since you I was very younger, much. I've looked up to you. Thank you. I was wondering what made you fully commit to like show business because I'm sure when you were younger, you were very maybe undecided and you were thinking maybe it's not realistic or serious. Uh, but absolutely. I know that sure it was in your heart and your, you know, your passion. It. So I was, thinking, I was wondering what part of your life like did you fully commit? Well, you know, I went through some very dark times. You know, from like '95 to. To, to 99, very dark, alcohol, a lot of alcohol. Had a little incident last year with some alcohol too. It's been a struggle for me uh, uh, to, to get that right. Never had a really good relationship with it. Kind of wish the one thing I would do all over again, I probably wouldn't drink anything for, for, for back then if I realized how much damage it can do to somebody. Uh, but um, you know, in, uh, in 2000, uh, Sandra Bullock came to see me at an improv in Brea, California. And then she got involved with me because she liked my stand-up to do the show. So it became my sitcom. But nobody was running out there to help me. So I owe her a, an, an incredible debt of gratitude for believing in me uh, and sticking with me and making that show happen. And then you have to do stuff on your own. I mean, I still had to deliver stories and a lot of them were from my life. But without that initial hand up, uh, I'm not sure uh, where I would be, and I think my career would be different without a hand, without without her assistance. So I, I and she knows how much I, I re respect and and love her for that. Hello, my name is Andre. I'm a young actor based here in New York. Uh, favorite song? I would say Kanye West, "Good Life." All right. That uh song changed my life. Um, as far as the question, I wanted to know when it comes to intention and the career thing, this the industry, this I call it an industry. It is. I feel like I came in it for a different intention. How do you stay focused on that and still be business 
oriented. What what's what 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 intention do you what what do you aspire to to do in that business? I feel like I can use this medium to talk to people basically and to help people find their purpose in life. Yep. That's how I I mean Will Smith was one of my biggest you know people. Yes. I, I mean when I I right. didn't learn from teachers, I didn't learn from preachers, I learned from artists. Right. And how do you stay focused on that? And also stay business oriented. Well, you know the 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 thing is that uh, the public personality is kind of like a veneer to the other person underneath. So if you separate the two and not not believe that you are uh, super or better than anyone else, so you just try to remain humble underneath and then do your work that you have to do. But you know, I've run into a lot of people when I had my talk show that that really did think they were they were special. You know, really just were affected by the business. Uh, they're very and, sad uh, people, man. <laughs> they're very sad people. I, well, I meet them every day. Oh, right. Every day of my life, they start to walk around like you know, like they are uh, detectives or mafiosos, or uh, it, it, and it does that kind of does affect you. But if you stay grounded and stay real underneath and let the work speak for itself and not have to tell somebody who you are or what you do. You, you'll you'll find a place and you'll inspire other people because of humility humility inspires people you know somebody being humble and yet remaining talented and focused and driven but yet you know down to earth it's a tough combination to get but but you know what what's so beautiful about like this you got movie it. I feel it this movie spare parts is an example of how he's doing that because it's funny it's really entertaining but it has a mission and and it has it has a very clear intention that will really blow you away when you see it. And that's... Uh, thank you. It's, it's good for you to hear it from someone who's not him, because I've seen the movie, and I think it's a terrific movie, and it really does... It'll, it'll answer all your questions. Yeah. I wish you the best of luck as well. My favorite song. Hmm. Dime. One of the Beatles. She love you, yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 She, she love, love you, yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah, And I yeah. come from Mexico. Oh. Yes. The Beatles, hey, Mexico and the Beatles. <laughs> yes, of Very course. Impressive. Yeah, right? Of course. Yeah. <laughs> I remember I was in Mexico and they were playing Yellow Submarine and nobody could oh, speak yeah. English, but everybody was singing Yellow Submarine. <laughs> that was badass. It might have been the margaritas, but it might have been Yellow <laughs> Submarine too. A little bit of both. True. You ever think about to go back to Mexico? I mean, work in Mexico and do some in films in there? Um, hmm. You know, this movie is going to premiere in Mexico, and it's called Los Inventores, the Inventors. So this movie will go will go to Mexico. Yes, but uh, I think Eugenio uh, Derbez is a, an incredibly talented actor from Mexico and I would I would love to have him help me with the Mexican audience and then me help him to get get a larger American audience and do a movie together. I think that would be good. Yeah, I would like that. Well, the movie is called Thank Spare you. Parts. Gracias, Esther. Stars George Lopez. Thank you. You're very kind. Listen everybody. I know everybody. This is a, I I appreciate every one of you coming here to listen to me talk about this movie. I think you will like this movie. Listen, it is inspiring. We, we've, it, whether, however you live your life, we all want to be somebody. And this movie is about kids becoming somebody, but not posing, earning it. It all has to be earned. To be appreciated, it must be earned. Yes. Thank you, everybody. So thank you, and thank you, 